just a disclaimer to those of you listening. Um, earlier today, I <laughs> fell. I'm a fall risk now, apparently. <laughs> just fell. I didn't even trip on anything. I literally, um, we were going, me, Alana, and Isabel were going to Savers. And I was kind of like lagging a bit behind, just taking my time. And then I fell so slowly. Like, <laughs> like one leg just gave and like I twisted an ankle. And then I was just like, huh? You had like time to complete several thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I was like, oh. As no. you went down. Because I thought I was just going to trip. I was like, oh, that'd be embarrassing. And then I just went <laughs> down. went the whole way, yeah. But I've been on my feet all day, so now it's like hella swollen. And I've got like a gnarly little graze on my knee. I feel like a skateboarder. Like, yeah, check out my battle wounds, dude. <laughs> but, um, oh yeah, so the disclaimer is I got home and I took four ibuprofen. After 10 minutes, I'm like, ah, it's not working, whatever. <laughs> so I took like three, like, codeine, codeine things, yeah. like 30 milligrams each. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that also have like, 500 milligrams of paracetamol and then also i had like some of a joint so in conclusion oh my god so that's where we are right now that's where we are so like, we don't condone this by the way we're not right don't try this at don't, home. don't try this at home <laughs> but do you remember when mm. you were first going to have sexual congress with your husband before marriage Yes, Sorry. I do. Yeah, she still oh, had, don't. <laughs> she still had like the remnants of her period, and I looked I up how to stop like it. The end. And I was like, you have to take eight ibuprofens. And then I did it, and then I looked it on. Online. <laughs> she's like, like, and she's like, can like, I die? She was like, okay. She took all of them, and then after she took them, she's like, maybe that was a bad idea. And that's when I started my research after the fact. And I was like, you'll be fine. And I was. And now but she's married. Do so if you ever want to get married. <laughs> potentially <laughs> take eight ibs it's just... like um you know like little spells yeah. <laughs> girls do to catch a man take eight ibuprofen and have like an overnight sex kiss so we were going to do the dustiest whitest longest book ever written don't say what it is it's a surprise um, and, and i started preparing that and then sort of the end of the world happened and oh yeah um and then i thought maybe we can Try something else. Mm-hmm. Well, we do one then. Yeah. So we're, tonight we're going to do I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings by Maya Angelou. Oh, that's great. I never really found out why the caged bird sings. <laughs> or she's going to tell you. <laughs> so I'm excited. Or is she? Because this is actually an autobiography. Uh, so, shall we begin? Oh, we should probably say what this is. Oh, a literature. <laughs> the podcast. <laughs> Welcome. With your hosts. <laughs> You. Sandy. And you. Sam. (laughs) That was cute. (laughs) That's good. Okay. So it's the 1930s in a small town called Stamps. 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 Like the ones you put on letters? (laughs) Yeah. That's its its sister town. (laughs) Letters. Letters. (laughs) Letters and stamps. You know how towns will have like sister towns in like Norway or something? Yeah. There's like, there's a town called Boring. (laughs) Well, what's its sister it, town? Is it interesting? It's, it's called Dull. <laughs> I think it's Oregon, boring Oregon and Dull Wales or something. <laughs> so we've got... Um, Boregon. <laughs> took you a little while. So we're in Stamps in Arkansas. So a young Maya Angelou, then known as Marguerite Johnson, is standing in church reciting a poem to her church congregation. Except she freezes and she can't finish it. How old is she again? She's, um, it doesn't say exactly, so like five or six. Oh, okay. I was... Yeah. uh, yeah, There's a bit of like time. Because I was just like... I said a young (laughs) Maya. But yeah, it it kind of... A lot of the stories in this, because it is like little episodic stories, it doesn't always say. And some of... Like it might be out of order and it might not. It's kind of I know she's a poet, but with the way that she wrote this book, is it like kind of long form poetry or is it just like kind of essays or sorry it's it's essays it's it's kind of it's autobiographic it's is it like called Belgian autobiographic ish? fiction because she kind of narrativizes it and turns it into a story it's just prose is it like bell jar though so it's like it's poetic but it but it is just prose Anyway, she's wearing a second-hand lavender taffeta dress that she realizes was probably probably previously owned by a white woman. 
Oh. Um, and she starts to fantasize about one day waking up from her, quote, ugly black dream. Oh. And becoming a pretty blonde white girl. <sighs> That's so sad. Yeah. <laughs> I'm already uh, Oh, sad. get ready. <laughs> oh, no. Um... <clears throat> Eventually, she runs away from the church, um, runs out of the church, peeing, crying, and laughing all at the same time. And oh, we've been there. She, yeah, she knows she's going to get in trouble. But. Okay, so we learn that Maya came to Stamps with her big brother Bailey when she was three years old. Sorry. And he was four. After their Californian parents divorced. So their parents live in California. Their parents put them on a train um, with only the porter to look after them, but he got off the train in Arizona leaving them completely alone with only notes with their destination written on them pinned to their clothes. (laughs) Excuse me, uh, just a a question. (laughs) So their parents got divorced in California. Mm -hmm. And instead of the one of them taking (laughs) Taking them, they sent them to their paternal grandmother. Why can't they just take them? Good question. Maya. She doesn't know. She's three. Will she, is this the caged bird? Is she the caged bird? Perhaps. Mayhaps. All right, all right. So terrible parenting. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. So they've they've got notes pinned to their clothing. It says to whom it may concern. These children need to get off in stamps. So that was their stamp. <laughs> oh, the stamp. <laughs> They're sent to live with their paternal grandmother, as I said, um, who they call Mama. Oh. who owns and runs the only general store in the black area of Stamps. So she's pretty well off and doing yeah. better than a lot of the, even the white residents during the Depression. Good. And despite this being the height of Jim Crow. Oh, God. Um, and just a refresher for everyone, Jim Crow laws mandated racial segregation in all public facilities mm-hmm. in the states of the former Confederate States of America. Um, and it started in the 1870s and the 1880s. It's like the se- separate but equal thing that you hear a lot. That's kind of what they were. So it seems like cotton was one of the main industries around stamps. So during the harvesting season, Mama would get up at 4.30 a.m. to sell lunches to the cotton pickers. Um, Maya describes the atmosphere of the store at dawn as sort of magical. And the cotton pickers are always in good spirits, bragging about how fast they're going to work. They'll bring in the most cotton out of all their workmates kind of thing. They're kind of chipper. Yeah. Um, by the time they've returned in the evening, however, they are dusty and beaten down by futility. And instead of joking and laughing, they would mutter about weighted scales and being cheated out of their earnings and things like that. Oh. In the future, Maya reflects um, she will confront the idea of the happy singing black cotton picker with such rage that even other black people will tell her to chill out <laughs> and that she's being paranoid. But um, she, you know, she sees it as them being kept in poverty by a system that won't even allow them to make ends meet, much less pay their debts. Sounds familiar. So, also living with Mama is her second son, the kid's Uncle Willie. He was purportedly crippled by being dropped as a baby, though from the way he's described, it seems like he has the symptoms that resemble cerebral palsy. Oh, like. Okay. Like he walks on a crutch and he speaks with difficulty and oh. though, but mama insists on the story and that he wasn't born that way. So I think that's whether or not that's true. And I think Maya is kind of saying it's ambiguous. That's, oh. that's what I got from it. Um, I think that it's important to mama that, that people don't think he was born that way for whatever reason. Hmm. So, Sue. Apparently he's disrespected and joked about in the community um, because possibly because he can't work, oh. but due to his mother's business, he's still better off than a lot of able-bodied black men. So he has like fresh, fresh shirts and everything. And yeah, so he's the children's disciplinarian. Um, well, what I suppose mama disciplines them too, but he, at one point, he threatens to throw them on the hot stove if they forget their times tables. And at one point, Maya tries to throw herself on the stove preemptively. <laughs> um, yes. And she talks about, Maya Angelou talks about, like, because children think if they can co- conquer the thing they're afraid of, then they like they won't have to be afraid anymore, that kind of thing. Oh my god, no, that makes so much sense. Mm. So I was like, I'll just do it. And then, <laughs> and then I will throw myself on the stove. <laughs> yeah. Um... But he stops her from burning herself, which to me it seems to suggest that he never actually intended to burn them. Just... Uh, only once does Maya see Willie hiding his disability when two strangers are in the store and he's leaning on the counter 
sort of with his crutch, nowhere in sight. He's hidden it. And she's filled with tenderness for him, realizing he must tire of the pity and condescension mm. and may have simply just wanted to be free for it for a little while. During this time, Maya discovers her love for reading and also reportedly falls in love, um, quotation marks, with William Shakespeare, which she feels guilty for because he's white. <laughs> Yeah. One afternoon, Mr. Stewart, the white former sheriff, swings by to warn Mama that the, quote, boys mm. are out looking for a scapegoat as apparently a black man, quote, messed with a white woman. Oh, no. Yeah. It's on the time to kill. Remember <laughs> that movie? I don't think I've seen it. Is Sandra that, is Bullock, that sort Matthew of Jim McConaughey. Crow? Racial unrest. That sounds southern. Lawyers. <laughs> Lawyers. It was very southern, yeah. Mm. Um, Mama gets the children to help her clear out some potato bins so that Willie can lie down and hide in them to avoid being lynched. Luckily, the men don't come by the store. <laughs> lynched. There it is again. Can you look up a time to kill, please, Alana? I just want to make sure I said the right thing. Oh, my God. Lynching. What? Who said that was okay? Who was like... <sighs> White people. It was the, it was the correct... Correct names? Mm -hmm. Luckily, the men don't come by the store, but Maya remembers hearing Willie moaning in pain all night and reflects that if they had come, he would have been fairly easily found, even if he had been quiet. Why was he moaning just from his disability? His pain, yeah. Oh, and he wasn't getting managed, I guess. Yeah. Poor guy. She also reflects that the word boys isn't really appropriate for murderous old white men. Which is fair. For Maya, her older brother Bailey is her whole world. While she feels she is tall and unattractive, he is small and handsome, and he has... And he's older? He's like a year older, I think, yeah. Why is he small? I don't know. It's just... He goes to bat for her when anyone insults her. Oh, um, and he'll call them or their children ugly <laughs> in a clever way. You're ugly. Um, later it's revealed her nickname Maya was actually given to her by Bailey, who, uh, when he was young, called her Maya sister. Oh, <laughs> that's so cute. Yeah. What's her actual name again? Her Marguerite. Marguerite. Maya. <laughs> the only children who do not respect Mama are the po white trash children. Here they come. <laughs> who call her by her first name, Annie. Which um, is seems seems really common, kind of in the South, as a way white people kind of put Disrespect. black people in their in their place, kept them down. It really upsets Maya to hear Mama and Willie disrespected by these dirty white children. <laughs> Did you just add that in? <laughs> Not really. Did she say dirty white? Well, they're, they're actually dirty because it's the depression and they're poor. And oh yeah, workers. everyone was dusty. Mm. One day, um, when Maya is ten, she sees three of the children approach the store. They torment Mama, mocking her posture and, like, gestures. And Maya cries in rage, but she knows she can't interfere. For her part, Mama sort of ignores them and keeps singing to herself. One of the girls does a handstand and her dress falls down to reveal she has no underwear on. (gasps) No. This seems particularly disrespectful. However, when the children leave and Mama returns, Maya realizes that somehow, and she isn't sure how, Mama had won the interaction. So I guess by being graceful yeah. in the face of the insult and, and not rising to it. Yeah. Mama teaches the children that it is not safe to speak to whites at all. Oh and goodness. certainly not with insolence. In fact, she doesn't even... Um, sh- sh- it's not even safe to talk about talk shit about whites when they're not around. Um, it's, oh, oh. It's and just... she will only do so by referring to whites ambiguously as they. <laughs> It's so just so crazy that anyone. even now people like that. Have you seen that like viral TikTok of this guy that like he's like 15 years old and he's like, "Hi Milo." <laughs> he has a list of like things that his mom told him not to do as a uh, like a young black man in America. Yeah, just like don't wear like the the do rag thing. Don't yeah, like, don't wear like hoodie. And party. if you ever get pulled over by the cops, always just have your hands up and say, "I'm just getting my license and registration. Mm-hmm. Please don't shoot me." Like. That's so fucked. Maya says Mama would have called herself a realist rather than a coward. For yeah. for these like yeah rules about speaking speaking to and about white people. Mm. Once Mama was called into court to testify regarding a black man who had escaped lynching by hiding in her store. It was another 
thing where he'd been accused of assaulting a white woman. And this was actually, um, and I was listening to another podcast about um, Ida B. Wells, and she was a, a, a sort of trailblazing African American journalist in the 19th century, like mm. way before it was easy. Um, and one of the things she wrote about was how accusing black men of sexually assaulting white women almost always has to do with controlling their ability to make money. So it's like economically successful black people. So that was that was a really common thing. It was always the this black man has flirted with, touched, assaulted a white woman, and that was the the majority of lynchings were were sort of carried out under that pretext, even though it wasn't really. With lynching, does it always lead to death? It's like you know they it's. It's yeah, I think it's only called lynching if, if it succeeds. Just because the main, the only lynching thing I know is that you know that really famous photo of the, the one that we we talked about in yeah, yeah. Eliza Men, you know, but uh, his remains were all, like burnt and stuff, mm-hmm. and it's just harrowing. The judge subpoenas her to testify. However, not knowing she's a black woman, he refers to her as Mrs. Henderson, accidentally affording her the respect of a white woman. To Maya, this seems... What would they normally call her if they knew she was black? Annie. Oh, just disrespecting her. Yeah. To Maya, this seems emblematic of her high status in stamps. She's like, if any black woman in stamps could be called, you know, by her last name, by a judge, it's it's Mama. Mm. It's Mrs. Henderson. Maya's parents send her and Bailey gifts for Christmas one year. Maya receives a doll and a tea set. Both she and Bailey cry, and they even destroy the doll together. They, like, smash it. I think it was a China doll. Why? Because they hate their mom? Because they had convinced themselves their mother was dead, as a preferable alternative to the idea that she abandoned them. Oh, what about the dad? Um, I'm not sure if they convinced themselves he was dead, too. But, yeah. But a similar, a similar thing. I think they feel like they've been abandoned by their parents. Um, no grandpa, I'm guessing, did. Paternal? I think so. I like think Mama's a... husband. Yeah, I don't think. He's not He's not in the picture. It's just Mama and it's Willie? It's just Mama and Willie. Uncle Willie. Oh my god. Mama tells them off for being ungrateful. <laughs> Fair enough. One day, Big Bailey, or Daddy Bailey, oh, don't comes to visit. That. He's the children's father. So he is Daddy. Mm-mm, stop. He is. Don't do this. I'm sorry that white people ruined the word Daddy, but that's what he's called. So I'm going to call him Daddy, okay? <laughs> No. Just call him Pops. Pops. I call him Dad. Daddy Pops. <laughs> like in Homer. Puppy Pops. Puppy Pops. <laughs> Just call him DB. DB. Call him Big Bailey is Big better. Bailey is fine. Okay. Please don't call him Dad. <laughs> He's the children's father. He owns a car and he speaks posh. Um, <laughs> with apparently a lot of ers and uhs. You are going to the store? <laughs> like that kind of thing? You are going to uh, the uh, it's just, I, Yeah, posh, I guess. That's not posh. In the, in just... the 30s. I don't know. Just past things. <laughs> just 30 things. He's tall and handsome, mm. which is intimidating uh, to his little kids. <laughs> Do they not know their father? They're acting like they've never seen him before. They left when they were three and four. How old are they? Oh, they're like 10 or whatever. Yeah. So not really. They don't really know him at all. That's like, true. I don't remember much from when I was three and four. I wouldn't recognize someone that I met then and hadn't seen since. You'd be a bad witness to a crime then. <laughs> I think most three and four year olds would be bad witnesses to a crime. Just so disappointed. <laughs> In the three and four year olds of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Potential witnesses to crime. You gotta get them with a police sketch artist right away. <laughs> as soon as it finishes. Like, get them like a bright light or something. Or like, um, you know, the... Uh, oh. Like an etch a sketch. <laughs> oh, finger paints. <laughs> finger paints. <laughs> finger paint the suspect. <laughs> That's like, oh my god! Did you ever watch True Detective? Yeah, yeah. Do you remember? Okay, this is a spoiler for us who people haven't seen True Detective season one, but it was such an engaging show mm. up until the only thing that gave they're like, oh, I know who the murderer is. It's because the child that sat with the sketch artist said, like, the man had green ears. Turns out it was just paint from a house he was painting. That was disappointing. So it was usually, like, that's how they got him. (laughs) What, you were hoping he would have some weird disease or something? I don't know. It was just so stupid. (laughs) And I'm just like, 
you know what? Let him keep killing people. <laughs> if this is how you plan on catching him. <laughs> you don't deserve to catch him. <laughs> don't. Oh, gosh. Anyway, um, hot, so, hot daddy's in town. Yeah, Daddy Bailey. Or, well, we'll call him Big Bailey. Uh, I think he's deserved daddy now. Bailey Sr.? <laughs> oh, because he's, he's handsome? Papa Bailey. Papa. <laughs> he stays in stamps for three weeks. And wow. it gets to the point where Maya wishes he would leave. Because I don't think she knows how to act around him. Yeah. Um, and eventually he announces his intention to. Um, and also that he will take them with him to St. Louis to meet their mother. So she's living in St. Louis. Which I think is in Mississippi. But they're like divorced. Why is he going there? I think he's going to drop them off. Maybe she why asked for just, them. I don't know. Because they're kids, so no one tells them why it's all happening. So it never, she, it, the, the why of it never really gets brought up in the book, I guess, because the kids didn't know, you know? That's true. You're so smart and so patient. <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to say something? You have that face where you want to say something. Oh, yeah. Is St. Louis in Mississippi? Missouri. Missouri. So Mississippi, Mississippi is in Missouri. Is there, a ta- is there a state called Mississippi as well? Mississippi, Leslie. Yeah, yeah, there is. Hey, hey. Okay, well, at least there's a step. So I was wrong. <laughs> but also, you were kind of a little um, right. Cool, cool, cool. And I think it's just south of Illinois, if I recall correctly. We can stop. <laughs> Let's not. Um, Maya sees him as a stranger and can't get comfortable around him, but Bailey and he get along pretty well. Oh, no. Mama allows them to be driven away, and though she seems sad, only tells them to be good. Mm. She's basically raised them. Yeah. Are they coming back or is this like... I don't want to tell you yet. When they meet their mother, Vivian, in St. Louis, they are blown away by how beautiful she is. She looks like a movie star. Yeah, what's up with her hot parents? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Bailey in particular falls in love with her as it seems like they have similar personalities. Big Bailey leaves them with her, which Maya doesn't make much of. As far as she cares, he's a stranger who left them with another stranger. It's true. So, it's the heyday of Prohibition oh. in St. Louis, and Vivian introduces them to a whole bunch of underground organized crime figures, her mates, um, whose circles she runs in. Vivian's brothers, the Baxter boys, have city jobs and nice clothes and have a reputation for meanness. Oh, no. They'll fight anybody, white or black. How old are the kids now? I would say they're still really young. I would say um, seven to Oh, eight. really? Yeah. Because... The last you mentioned, they were like 10. Yes, she jumps around in the timeline a bit. She's definitely 8 while she's in St. Louis, so I think maybe she goes home when she's... They spent about a year there, if I recall correctly. Oh, okay, there we go. Thank you. You told me. Ha! (laughs) Traitor. Oh, (laughs) nuts! Get her. Get him, boys. Um, She says something like... I I love this line, and I like wrote, (laughs) wrote it down on my phone. Not word for word, but she says something like, they had each other they were so close to each other they never felt the need to make any other friends she means her brother right the brothers of vivian the baxter boys oh it's just peaky blinders that's what i was kind of thinking (laughs) because it's like that 20s thing peaky so yeah it's like a st louis version of that um Maya is in awe of them and they and she makes a point of the fact that they were mean but they were never cruel so they were like bruisers I think but they weren't like horrible dudes they were good dudes they were just kind of rough um love that trope for their part they seem to adore the kids and um they tell them all sorts of stories about what they were like as toddlers this is where Maya learns the origin of her nickname um one of them Uncle Tommy hey Tells, tells my Killian's in this too? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, he doesn't get oh, this yeah, role. Oh, <laughs> yeah, wait. Nope, not this one. Not this one. Sorry. Killian. Scarlett Johansson maybe could. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> got her. Not to got her, boys. <laughs> uh, um, so, yeah, Uncle Tommy tells Maya she doesn't need to worry about being pretty because she's smart. Great, thanks. Which makes a big impression on her. Yeah, he basically called her Uggo. No, <laughs> he's like, no. Like if she was like, I'm not pretty. He's like, but you're smart, and that's more important. That's what they tell ugly people. <laughs> Sam, you're ruining them. <laughs> so when she realizes that she's, it's when she, she, her intelligence is valued for the first time. Come on. 
At first, Bailey and Maya live with their maternal grandmother, a white passing um, German woman. Oh. I think she. I think she's only part white, but but they make a point of her being German. And she has a lot of connections in the cops, in the courts, mm-hmm. and the underworld. She's like a bit of a mover and a shaker. It's Polly. Um, and she carries her pince nez glasses on a chain. <laughs> Eventually, however, they move. The kids move in with Vivian and her older, fat boyfriend, who she only calls Mister Freeman. She says she feels sorry for him because he has boobs like a woman. <laughs> Why is she with this dude when her ex is apparently like daddy status? Well, no idea. No idea. Maybe he left her. Do you ever find out why they divorced? Or is it just like, uh, don't worry about it? It's one, I guess it's one of those things that they never knew. They were never told. Yeah. You know? I mean, maybe later, but yeah, it doesn't come up in the book. Yeah. Anyway, she's with this dude called Mr. Freeman. Maya implies that Mr. Freeman may have been jealous or suspicious of Vivian's activities. And he spends most of his day waiting for Vivian to return. She works nights. She, like, runs poker games and stuff. Ah, I see. Um... Maya begins having nightmares, so she starts sleeping in the bed with Vivian and Mr. Freeman. Oh. She's eight years old. Mr. Freeman sexually molests Maya twice while Vivian is gone, before finally raping her. No. He threatens to kill Bailey if she speaks out about it. No. And sends her away to the library where she was often, she often spent a lot of her time reading. She comes home, though, because she's in so much pain. No. Yeah. I didn't know it was going to be terrible. She was eight and then she got yeah. raped. Her mother at first thinks she has the measles and makes preparations to take care of her. Tucked into bed, Maya hears Vivian and Freeman arguing in the next room. In the morning, Vivian tells Maya Mr. Freeman has moved out. When she and Bailey try to change Maya's bed linens, the bloodied panties she hid in them fall out. And they realize what's happened to her. Vivian, to her credit, immediately takes Maya to hospital. Bailey privately tells Maya to tell him who did this to her, but she tells him he threatened to kill Bailey if she tells. Um, Bailey dismisses the threat, reassuring Maya that no one's going to kill her. And she she thinks, well, Bailey would never lie to me, so he must be right. Oh, no. When she names Mr. Freeman, he's arrested. The nurses and visitors of the hospital tell she has experienced the worst of what life as a woman has to offer. Yeah. And she says she wishes she could stay in the hospital for the rest of her life because everyone's lovely and brings her flowers and is kind to her and takes care of her. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was in the hospital as a kid and it was awesome. People <laughs> just bring you stuff yeah. and you just get to eat like whatever you want. What did you have? What happened to you? Um, when I was in the fifth grade, I had to go into the hospital because I had mild dengue fever. Oh. And it sucked because um, we were... There was going to be like a big talent show at school oh. and our class was going to do um, Helena by MCR and I was Helena. Oh. But then it, apparently it was too hard to drum anyway. So when I was stuck in hospital, they did Dirty Little Secret by All American Rejects instead. Wow. But anyway. At least they didn't do Helena without you. I know. But um, yeah, I was in the hospital. for oh. <laughs> Yeah, I was in the hospital. But it was just mild. It, I, it didn't have to do yeah. the blood transfusions and That's stuff. Good. But it yeah. was... Just, I think, yeah, because of that experience, I don't mind getting stuck with needles because, like, they'd wake they wake me up every three yeah. hours to take my blood and stuff. Mm-hmm. So you kind of got yeah acclimatized to it a little. Yeah, like I've never like like it doesn't really phase me. Like you can stick mm-hmm. me with six needles oh, right I now can't stand in it. any <laughs> like a surprise. Have you had, would you have acupuncture? Yes. Oh, I so badly want to try acupuncture because mm. I get such bad migraines. Yeah, oh, true, true. And also, like, I always want to feel, like, what a tattoo gun feels like because it's just, like, needle central, you know? True. Quick question. Yeah, of course. Was Mr. Freeman white? No. 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 Really? I imagine. I, I thought he was white, too. Mm. Oh, I don't think that was allowed back then, though. In Like, interracial. Yeah, interracial That's, interracial. like... True. Remember, like... Was it you yeah. that said, or was it Isabel? Like literally, fifty-three been... years ago was mm-hmm. when it was no, like legal. Yeah, and, and there were people, you know, like, illegally, sec- yeah, secretly doing it. But I believe I believe that Maya Angelou herself um, married a Greek man, or, or she was definitely um, partnered to him. I'm pretty sure she married him, and um, and that was still hugely controversial, yeah. even as an as an adult. I can't believe she got raped at Yeah, age no, it's eight. rough. 
Like, you're not a child anymore after that. Yeah, well, but, um, she feels like she's a woman now. And they're like, well, you know everything now. Yeah, like, you literally, mm-hmm. your childhood is over. Yeah. After that. Like, you can't go back to mm-hmm. who you were before that. Yeah. So, Maya feels guilt after the court hearing for lying about the previous two times Freeman molested her. Um, she said that the rape was the first. She fears she'll be rejected by her family if she admits to them. Oh. Then it might suggest she had invited his attentions or wanted them. Oh. Mr. Freeman turns up dead. Probably killed by Maya's uncles. Nice. Except she feels overwhelming guilt. Like by naming him, she caused him to die. And she Good. feels like she's a sinner. No, she's not. And that he died because she lied. He died because he's a piece of Yeah, shit. but she didn't understand that as an eight-year-old. Um, so she her. stops talking. She's like, <gasps> she's like, I, this happened because I spoke, I think. So she, she, I think selective mutism is actually a thing for child children who experience trauma. But um, she stops talking to anyone except Bailey. Mm. She'll only talk to Bailey. At the first, the family accepts the silence as like a part of her, um, as part of the sort of process. But as it persists and she doesn't kind of get over it, they begin to be offended and angry with her. How long has she been like mute for? I'm not sure. She doesn't, yes. Why are they offended and angry? She's going through so much. (laughs) But people didn't get it. People still don't get it. And this is like before. This is the 30s. <laughs> Maya and Bailey eventually get sent back to stamps. And Bailey is disappointed, but Maya is relieved to be back somewhere where nothing happens. Oh, yeah. Soon after arriving, she meets a woman called Mrs. Bertha Flowers, who she calls the aristocrat of black stamps. Oh. She's a beautiful black woman who is always well-dressed and wears gloves. And she takes notice of Maya and how withdrawn she is. Um... I don't know, I, it's not said whether Mama tells Mrs. Flowers about what happened to Maya in St. Louis or if she has any kind of idea of that. Regardless, Mrs. Flowers invites Maya over to her house where she gives her buttery cookies made especially for her and reads to her aloud from A Tale of Two Cities by our main man, Chuck Duck. Chuck Duck. <laughs> um, so Mama definitely knows what happened to Maya. Maya uh, Mama it's... definitely knows. Yeah. Do you reckon she's upset? Like, you shouldn't have taken the kids away. Like, look what fucking happened. She maybe maybe part of her but a lot of m- mama's reactions to to bad things happening is like it's part of god's plan she's she's very kind of um pragmatic about that kind of thing she doesn't kind of wring her hands she just kind of deals with what's sent to her so maya is enraptured by this woman and she sends maya home with extra cookies for bailey when Maya offers the cookies to bailey mama flies into a rage and whips over the peach wood switch to her utter bewilderment Later, my learns it's because she used the phrase "by the way," as Jesus is the way. Saying this is basically blaspheming. By the way, by the way, like BT dubs. Yeah, so Jesus is the way. Therefore, if you say "by the way," you're taking Jesus' name in vain. What do you mean? She was. It's just very like, confusing. She was just like, "These cookies are for you, by the way," and, <laughs> and yeah, and she didn't get it at all. And then later, Bailey tries to explain it to her what it actually means, but she just won't, won't hear it. Okay, so at the age of ten, Maya takes a job as a housemaid in the home of a white woman named Mrs. Viola Cullinan. The cook, whose name is Glory, is the descendant of slaves who once worked, um, who were sorry, who were once owned by the Cullinans. Glory takes Maya under her wing and reveals to Maya that Mrs. Cullinan can't have children, which inspires pity and tenderness in Maya for the woman. She's often referred to by her family and people as having a tender heart. Maya or the, the white Maya, woman? Maya. So yeah. she's tender hearted. So they don't make her go to funerals because she's tender hearted and like, you know, sensitive, I guess. Um, so yeah, so Maya feels, feels sorry for Mrs. Cullinan. However, one day when serving Mrs. Cullinan and her friend's tea, On the veranda, one of Mrs. Cullinan's friends suggests that she call Maya Mary because Margaret takes too long to say. Not even Marguerite, her actual name. (laughs) Margaret. (laughs) Maya resents this but says nothing. However, later Mrs. Cullinan actually calls her Mary. But isn't her name Maya at this point? Like her nickname is Maya? I think only only Bailey calls her that. I Uh. think she takes it as a pen name later in her life. Oh, okay. So um, it's just like maybe like only family calls her. I think Maya. probably, yeah. And so she's like, hey. And like mama calls her sister. 
when oh. she refers to her. So I guess she's like, I'm Marguerite. Mm. And she's like, you're Mary. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, at first she's like, you're Margaret. And then later she's like, actually, you're Mary. Yeah, two degrees of wrong. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And anyway, Maya's had it. She knows Mama won't permit her quitting, so she asks Bailey's advice for getting herself fired and ends up accidentally, in quotation marks, smashing a bunch of Mrs. Cullinan's heirloom china. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> like a cat, just like... Yeah, like... Oh. <laughs> Mrs. Cullinan calls Maya the N-word and pretty much forgoes any of the Southern gentility that usually cloaks white prejudice. Oh my God, talking through your burp again like John Mulaney. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I'll say it again. Um, she forgoes any of the southern gentility that usually cloaks white prejudice. Ha! Huh? She also notes... Did you come up with that phrase? Yeah. You're so smart. Oh, no, fucking... thank you. I hate... Like, oh my God, I was listening to you. T- I'm like, is this from Spark Notes? Like, oh, oh, some of it is, but not that part. I did write that part. <laughs> So Maya also notes Glory cl- crying over the China too, calling it our China. That's uh, one of her observations. When one of Mrs. Cullinan's friends asks just a fucking point, right? if it was Mary who did it, Mrs. Cullinan spits, it was Margaret, which seems to give Maya some satisfaction. Yeah, I get it. One evening, Bailey doesn't make his curfew. <gasps> and Mama starts to get worried. I'm worried. A lot of bad things could have happened to a young black boy in the South. Yep. She takes a flashlight and Maya. Do you know what the curfew time is? No. Okay. Doesn't matter. And they go out in the dark to find him. Eventually they do find him. Oh my God. Wait. He's fine, but he seems downcast <sighs> and he takes his whipping in silence. What? <clears throat> That's just normal. That's just part of life. Just pass. Later, Maya learns that he'd gone to see a movie and stayed late to watch the second showing because the lead actress, Kay Francis, looked just like their mother. Oh. It's weeks before another Kay Francis movie comes to the theater and this time Bailey takes Maya with him. She hears the white audience down below because I think the black audience is like up on the mezzanine. You know how in the Aster they have like the two levels? Mm -hmm. I think that was how they'd split it. Great. um, Under Jim Crow. But she hears, yeah, she can hear the white audience um, laughing, and she's delighted to think that they're admiring someone who looks just like her black mother. Is it a black actress? No, it's a white actress. Mm. But like, she's like, if they think she's pretty and wonderful, like then they secretly must think that my mother is pretty. If that makes sense. Chuck us, you're fine, or just show it to me. <laughs> okay, so that's Vivian Baxter, very pretty. Mm-hmm. Gorgeous. Oh, woman. wow, yeah. She's gorgeous. She's an actress. So she was a silent film actress. Oh, I get it. No. Kind of yeah. same face shape. But yeah. oh my yeah. god, they're like, mother. Oh. Yeah, right? <laughs> Can you try finding a photo of the hot dad? dad? What's the dad's name? <laughs> um, Bailey. Daddy Bailey. Bailey. Bailey Johnson? Bailey Angelou. Henderson, I think. The movie improves Maya's spirits, but Bailey's downcast again. He obviously misses his mother a lot. On their way home, he dashes across the train tracks in front of an oncoming train scaring her. Just a little bit of thrill seeking, you know, like the girl in Footloose. <laughs> I haven't seen Footloose. You haven't seen that? No. Only, you should watch it and then you should listen dancing. to my episode on Sandra's podcast about it. On Oldie But A Goodie. Good one. Uh, anyway, the annual revival meeting comes to stamps. So it's like, it's hard to describe and I don't fully understand it but it's like a meeting of a bunch of different black churches in the area like different sects like mm, I, I don't know the exact sects but like say Methodist Baptist and then you've also got the Holy Rollers and they all come together for this like one kind of event and it's held under a tent, a tent. A big, oh my god a it's old burning tent. man a little I don't know it kind of reminded me of like I don't know I've seen depictions on TV of like faith healers kind of traveling around and they sort of People come to worship. But anyway, this yeah, they call it a revival. Um, Maya doesn't feel like the tent's quite sanctimonious enough. She's a bit she's a bit unconvinced. <laughs> but <laughs> she's like, really? <laughs> <laughs> However, she and the rest of the congregation are deeply moved um by the sermon that this priest gives, um, which is a condemnation of false charity, which is a thinly veiled critique of white Christian hypocrisy. <laughs> For anyone listening at home, I just shock it. <laughs> Have my tongue out a little like. Eh. 
So, so for example, charity is not giving someone a job and demanding they call you master sort of thing. Like, yeah, it promises divine revenge and justice at the end. The preacher reaches out to the unsaved, which I guess means like the unbaptized, mm. anyone who doesn't belong to a church already saying they can join any of the churches represented at the meeting. So he doesn't put his church forward first. He says, join any of the churches, um, which is unprecedented in Maya's experience. And she supposes this to be a great act of charity. The sermon puts the congregation in high spirits, but on their way home, they pass by a honky tonk party that seems to cast a pall over them. Honky tonk. <laughs> um, did, um, did she keep journals as a child or is she just recalling this as she wrote? I think she recalls wow. ad- as far as I know. Yeah. God, imagine just remembering. Oh, like I suppose you could, and and I guess the more you write about it, the more you kind of you remember. Yeah. Um. What what is a honky tonk? It's a. I mean, what? my understanding is that it's an out of tune piano. <laughs> it's a honky tonk piano, but I think maybe she's. It's referring to the style of music they're playing. Um, you know, like. <laughs> Back in the, the day, job. sort of ragtime and and jazz was considered a little bit sinful and mm, a jazz. bit yeah, a bit seen Chicago. subversive. Yes, so um, maybe that maybe that's what oh, it's referring to. Alana's googling. It's Google just such a fun word. <laughs> yeah. Honky tonk. Uh, so it's people like Ernest Tubb. Mm-hmm. Um, do you know that name? Nope. <laughs> but I sounded like I did, didn't I, when I went, mm-hmm. <laughs> Like a liar. <laughs> you know, like a liar. <laughs> you know. <laughs> was a style of piano playing related to ragtime, but emphasizing rhythm more than melody and harmony. Sure. So, yeah, okay. like jazz. Yeah, jazz yeah, yeah. okay, cool. Um, Hello, my So this, this party, the sounds of this party remind them of the sins of the black community in a way. Maya, from her position as an older writer, reflects that both the attendants of the revival and of the party were trying to escape the same harsh reality. Mm. Another afternoon, people crowd around a radio in Mama's general store to listen to Joe Lewis, a hero for black Americans, defend his heavyweight champion title in boxing. Um, So this is a really high stakes match for the entire town because, um, here's a quote, when he takes a hit, my race groaned. It was our people falling. It was another lynching. Yet another black man hanging on a tree. This might be the end of the world. If Joe lost, we were back in slavery and beyond help. Joe wins, thankfully, and the people celebrate with abandon. Maya says by winning, he proved that black people are the strongest people mm. in the world. And I guess it just goes to show how few areas they had to kind of rally around exactly. someone like that yeah. and <laughs> feel represented <laughs> um so he was he was a huge huge important player yeah like um oh what's that guy's name the one that the, ran uh, jesse owens jesse owens yeah. yeah it's the annual summer fresh fish fry time for women to show off their baking skills and men to fish the local pond who's gonna fry him actually i really want to I'm so sorry to take a second right now, but I did want to actually read you the list of food Yeah. <laughs> that she... Please don't apologize. We're having a great time. I'm um, so engaged. The amount... So this is a quote from the book. The amount and variety of foods would have found approval on the menu of a Roman epicure. <laughs> Pans of fried chicken covered with dish towels sat under benches next to, mountain, next to a mountain of potato salad crammed with hard-boiled eggs. Whole rust-red sticks of bologna were clothed in cheesecloth. Homemade pickles and chow chow and baked country hams, aromatic with cloves and pineapples, vied for prominence. Our steady customers had ordered cold watermelons, so Bailey and I chugged the striped green fruit into the Coca-Cola box and filled all the tubs with ice, as well as the big black wash pot that Mummy used to boil her laundry. Now they too lay sweating in the happy afternoon air. Oh, what's that? Um, the summer picnic gave ladies a chance to show off their baking hands. On the barbecue pit, chickens and spare ribs sputtered in their own fat and, and a sauce whose recipe was guarded in the family like a scandalous affair. However, in the ecumenical light of the summer picnic, every true baking artist could reveal her prize to the delight and criticism of the town. Orange sponge cakes and dark brown mounds dripping with Hershey's chocolate mm. stood layer to layer with ice white coconuts and light brown caramels. Pound cakes sagged with their buttery weight and small children could no more resist licking the icings than their mothers could avoid slapping the sticky fingers. Oh. How nice is that? 
just love how she writes it. That's yeah. so beautiful. Like I felt like I I know I'm like like buzzed on painkillers right now. <laughs> uh, but like I felt like I was there. I was like, <laughs> yeah, oh God, it's beautiful. Any and for me, anytime a writer like decides to tell us about food, <laughs> I know I get so I excited. Like, tell me. I'm like, tell me everything. <laughs> and it just sounds amazing. Okay, so music and the calls of children playing fills the air. Maya gets overwhelmed and tries to escape into a clearing, laying back and looking up at the sky. She's happened upon by another girl named Louise Kendricks. At first they're shy, but eventually they warm up to each other enough to hold hands and spin around, looking at the sky. I'm guessing she's like, what, nine or so? (sighs) Yeah, around, yeah. Um, They become best friends and learn (gasps) the very complicated secret language tut because all the other kids already know Pig Latin. (laughs) I love that. (laughs) Um, Maya as a writer reflects that after being a woman for so many years her friendship with Louise allowed her to be a girl this knee breaks it's just so much yeah like my heart hurts yeah in the seventh grade an eighth grader named Tommy Valdon sends Maya a letter asking her to be his valentine is this a white boy or no no um, Oh, they were. She would have said if he was a white boy, but yeah, they didn't school together. Schools were segregated. Yeah, great. She asks Louise what she makes of it. Who says it means he loves Maya? Mm. Maya says never again, not explaining what she means to Louise. But at Louise's suggestion, they tear up the note and throw it into the wind. Never again. That's like, please tell me more. (laughs) I think Louise is. She (laughs) she knew not to prod that probably. (laughs) She's discreet is the word I was looking for later Maya receives another note from Tommy saying he saw her tear up the note (laughs) (laughs) but that he doesn't think she meant to hurt his feelings and that he still wanted to be her valentine (laughs) however by the time Maya finally comes around to him Tommy's unfortunately already sort of gotten past his crush on her oh so yeah (laughs) okay boys being disappointing like (laughs) even in the 1930s (laughs) Even now. No. Bailey begins to play sexual games with girls in a little tent out in the backyard, making Maya stand watch for adults. (laughs) What are sexual games? The idea is that he plays the father, the girl will play the mother, and Maya plays baby. Um, In in this world, babies are sentries that watch out. (laughs) (laughs) Like a meerkat. (laughs) Um, Wait, I think, oh my god, you know what this reminds me of? <laughs> Brent Morin. It's like, you and I should uh, play, play house. <laughs> um, wait, what? Um, I think he just... They're not fucking, right? No, they were just humping, I think. Oh yeah, fair enough. But then he meets a girl called Joyce, who's a bit older. Oh no. And more developed. Who How old is knows he now? a little bit like more. Like 10, 11? I think he might be 12 or 13. Okay. But she... He loses his virginity to her. Oh, um, and he becomes obsessed with her and he starts stealing things from the shop for her. <laughs> she eventually leaves, though, and they hear she ran away with a railroad porter. And Billy, Bailey, Billy Bailey is heartbroken. Maya says that if she disliked Joyce before, which she did, she now hates her for hurting Bailey, as he was sweeter and happier when she had been around. Oh, one night, a man named Mr. Taylor, whose wife has just died, comes for dinner. Mama cares for him kindly, understanding his loss. He says that his late wife, Florida, that's her name. Well, okay. I think it was a lady's name before it was a state. And then maybe it fell out of. And then it, just means it was flower. Florida's name. <laughs> it was Florida's name Florida. before it was the state. <laughs> um, you don't you remember Florida? I, boy, do I. What's up? It's low, right? It's low, yeah. <laughs> yeah, apple bottom jeans, boots with the fur. With the fur, yeah. Whole club with the She hit the floor. She hit the floor. I hit the floor. <laughs> and the next thing you know. I got low. <laughs> That's so, but yeah. Low. Now I'm pretty high though, so. <laughs> happy middle, happy middle. <laughs> God, Footscray That's does culture. not care yeah. about you when you fall in their unsmiling streets. Oh. <laughs> Set. Mr. Taylor says his late wife, Florida, visited him as a ghost, which what? scares Maya. He says that she demanded children from him. She says, I want children or something like that, which is creepy. <laughs> yeah. Maya 
is creeped out. And she remembers seeing Florida's sunken face at the funeral, which was kind of her first confrontation with, like, death. How she died? Not important? I think she was just old. I think they're fairly oh, elderly. Yeah. She was just sick. Um, when Mama suggests that it was simply a dream, um, or that maybe if the spirit of Florida really did visit Mr. Taylor, perhaps her meaning was simply that he should work with the congregation's children at the church. Yep, that's exactly it. Maya is comforted by the idea that Mama could drive away any scary spirits with her sensibility and strength. So, graduation from the eighth grade in stamps is a big deal. <gasps> Mama has made Maya a beautiful yellow dress, and everyone says she looks like a sunbeam. <laughs> Isn't that the <laughs> nicest thing you've ever heard? <laughs> During the days leading up to it, the way she describes it, she's almost like a celebrity. <laughs> like, <laughs> and the whole town is proud of her. Bailey gives her a leather-bound book of Edgar Allan Poe's poems, um, whom they call Eep, which I think is the cutest shit. Edgar Allan Poe. Oh, Eep. <laughs> E-A-P. <laughs> yeah. And he, he had to save up for it. They closed the store that night, and it's closed. Graduation is the sign they put on the front. They're really proud. Um, Maya's actually... Did Bailey graduate eighth grade? Were they this yeah, they, excited? It would, would have probably been the same. It probably would have been okay. similar. But this Oh, yeah. Like, why would she pen. talk about Bailey? It's her book. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Maya has kind of constantly been in competition with this boy named Henry Reed for valedictorian. But in the end, he wins valedictorian. Uh, but they were like, yeah. But, you know, it's like she enjoys that, that she's kind well, of... She did. Yeah. <laughs> um, however, when she gets to graduation, she has a sense of uneasiness and dread. Oh, it doesn't no. seem quite right. There's a white man invited to speak, Mr. Edward Don Levy, oh. who I think has some small government role in the school district... And, and it, it's like, oh, he has to leave straight away after a speech because, oh, no schedules and whatever. And they, like, kind of try and play it down. But he's kind of literally the sh- just there to, like, give his re-election spiel and, and nick off. This guy talks about the good things the schools can expect to see in the future. And he sa- uses as an example the nearby white school, which received new lab equipment. In his speech, he also says that he's proud to say many great college athletes had come from their school. <laughs> Maya Thanks. feels like graduate day, gradu- graduation day has been darkened by this man's implication that athletics was all black boys could amount to, and that black girls couldn't even like have that. Like black girls aren't even in the in the question. In the speech, he was just like, yeah. "Black girls, what?" Maya has a moment of despair for her powerlessness in her life, and she wishes that Christopher Columbus never sailed to the New World. And she has this really dark speech, which I saved. Please read it. So this is one of the things she thinks during this speech, or after the speech. It's pretty, it goes pretty hard. We should all be dead. I thought I should like to see us all dead, one on top of the other. A pyramid of flesh with the white folks on the bottom as the broad base, then the Indians with their silly tomahawks and teepees and wigwams and treaties, then the Negroes with their mops and recipes and cotton sacks and spirituals sticking out of their mouths. The Dutch children should all stumble in their wooden shoes and break their necks. The French should choke to death on the Louisiana Purchase. <laughs> Eight, in brackets, 1803. While silkworms ate all the Chinese with their stupid pigtails. As a species, we were an abomination, all of us. <laughs> She's, she's feeling really, pretty. She went, she went really hard. She's a life. bit bitter <laughs> during the speech. Just a midge. However, Henry Reed's valedictorian speech fails to raise Maya's spirits. But he turns and addresses the graduating class directly, which I don't think was done. He like, because they're sitting, at, I think, on the stage and he was standing in front of them. So he turns his back on the audience and he, and he addresses the graduating class and he leads them in the song, Lift Every Voice and Sing known unofficially as the, quote, Negro National Anthem. Is so, this the valedictorian that does this? Yeah. Yeah, I was like, the white dude. dude. No, 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 the valedictorian. Oh. This manages to get through to Maya, who feels like she hears the words for the first time. And at last, she feels pride in her community. Good. Mm. And I didn't, I didn't get the words to that song. It's fine, we... Uh... Google it, guys. <laughs> Let us know what you think in the comments. Lift every voice and sing. What's the name of the song? A while later, Maya develops a toothache that's so bad she can barely see or walk. 
Ooh. It's like a lot of pain. Yeah, that means it's like mm. nerve. Yeah. The nearest black dentist practices 25 miles away. So Mama takes Maya to see Dr. Lincoln, the town's white dentist. Oh, no. He refuses to look at her teeth, saying he does not treat black patients. Mama reminds him of a generous loan she'd given him during the De- Great Depression. And he owes her a favor. Oh. Yes. But he doubles down and says he'd rather stick his hand in a dog's mouth. All right, let's get a dog then. <laughs> Maya's retelling of what happened next is that Mama shirt fronts the dentist and intimidates him into promising he'll never practice dentistry again. <laughs> um, but in Mama's retelling to Willie, she just demands interest on the loan. Which he reluctantly provides and then kind of demands a receipt as proof. A Good. little petulantly. Fuck that, dude. But I like Maya's version better. And so does she. <laughs> yeah. Can't fight. <find>, like, <laughs> and he like, I'm sorry. <laughs> I hate him. The ordeal so impresses Maya that she almost forgets her toothache. Mm. And Mama ultimately takes her to the black dentist in Texarkana. I can't believe you just wrote this book report. It's so eloquent. <laughs> Thank you. It's so much harder than I thought when I was writing mine. I was like, I hate this. <laughs> how does Sandy do this? And how does she tell it in such a way that's still engaging Aww. and like, ugh, stupid. <laughs> One day, Bailey comes home late from an errand. Oh, no. Ashen-faced and shaken up. Oh, no. When Mama inquires what took him so long, he asks what black people ever did to make white people hate them so much. I don't know, because white people were the ones that... They are doing that all the whole time, yeah. Yeah, they took them from their homes and then sold them like they weren't people. And then yep. they ex- and then now they're the ones that are mad. Mm-hmm. And it's just like, wait, hang on one second. <laughs> so you treat me like I'm not even a human person. You trade me off. And now you're mad at me. <laughs> mm. Yeah, yeah, I agree, yeah. Um, so what Bailey had seen was a black man's body um, pulled from a pond. And he'd been forced to help pull it from the pond. Mm. It was a swollen and rotting corpse. Mm. Grinning, the white man in charge ordered Bailey to get in the wagon with the dead body as a joke. Oh. Um, I think... And they that put, would smell so bad, like a bloated body. And I think it was like... I think there were prisoners in the wagon, like black prisoners. And they put the body in there. Like, I think it was a cop. So he had prisoners in the wagon... And he put the dead body in there with them. They were like, dude, don't, please. And then he's like, all right, you get it too now, son, or whatever. And Bailey, like, freaked out, as you would. Um, And he laughed. Not long afterward, Mama makes preparations to send the children to California. What? Maya speculates that this incident is what urged her to do so. She's like, I think maybe Bailey was at the age where he wasn't safe anymore. He He was too old. Mama lives in Los Angeles with Bailey and Maya for a time, while Vivian prepares living arrangements for the children. Maya and Bailey begin to see Vivian as a real person, with fears and insecurities for the first time, which actually endears her to them. I'm guessing um, Bailey's, what, like, 16 now, something like that? 17. Not quite. I think it's... they. Um, and that's already too old, like 14? Maybe 13, maybe... I'm not sure. I guess because he's starting to be a man. Yeah. And then he's, if you're not a child, Um, I can't. Maya. so depressing. (laughs) Sorry. That's America. She wakes them up at 2.30 a.m. one night to throw them a party (laughs) with music and sweet treats to the children's delight. And they are enchanted by how fun and spontaneous she is. Vivian. (laughs) Yeah. She's like, get up. (laughs) And then she gives them like, Sweets and puts on music and they dance. It's really lovely. Fun mom. Yeah. Um, Vivian is a trained nurse, but she runs poker games and other gambling activities, as I mentioned before. She is hot blooded and firm, but fair. Maya recalls a story of how Vivian shot her one of her business partners for verbally insulting her, which they both saw as water under the bridge now. <laughs> and now they're like have a healthy respect for each other. Like in the it leg was fair, or something? you know, he's like your shoulder maybe. Yeah, not yeah, Something probably not. Low stakes. In the, <laughs> low stakes, yeah. Probably not in the gonads or anything important. Low stakes. World War Two begins. And Vivian marries Daddy Clydell. Yes. World War Two begins and Vivian marries a man who Maya knows as Daddy Clydell. He's a successful businessman of simple background. I think he was a farmer's son. Um, and they all move together to San Francisco. And he's a... He's a businessman. 
So I think he owns property and stuff. He's got his hand in a couple of different pots. Maya talks, um, Maya the writer, talks for a little while about how Japanese culture in San Francisco um, was silently displaced by provincial black immigrants as, as the Japanese were sent to internment camps. Um, no one ever talks about it. And she notes that the lateral violence, maybe violence is the wrong word, but prejudice or um, because the Japanese weren't seen as a threat to the black community, they weren't seen to matter oh. at all. Um, Maya feels at home in San Francisco oh, that's for cool. the first time in her life. She gets put up a grade in school and later transfers to a majority white high school where she Ooh. comes across Miss Kerwin, a teacher who never treated Maya as different from being black and whose love for knowledge Maya respected. At 14, Maya receives a scholarship to the California Labor School where she studies dance and drama. Daddy Clydell becomes Maya's first true father figure. She loves his strength, honesty, and kindness. He's dignified without being haughty. He at once has no inferiority complex about receiving no formal education. And he also has no superiority complex for having become successful without a formal education. He's just a good dude. He's a, he sounds like a really good dude. <laughs> um, he introduces Maya to his conmen friends. So it's possible that he, he was involved in some maybe less legal stuff as well. But he definitely had legitimate business. He owned land and stuff. He introduces Maya to his con men friends who inspire her with stories about how they swindled bigoted whites out of tens of thousands. Good. She doesn't regard them as criminals because um, of how the deck was stacked against them from the beginning. You can't cheat a rigged game kind of thing. Yeah. Like if the game's rigged, cheating isn't, isn't an issue. Big Bailey, her biological father, oh, no. one summer invites Maya to come stay with him for the holiday. His girlfriend, Dolores, meets Maya at the station. She is engaged to Bailey, but he keeps postponing the wedding. <laughs> She's very prissy and proper. <laughs> Wait, her brother didn't come with them? Just her? No, just her. Yeah, maybe he had something. <laughs> I don't know. He was busy. <laughs> <laughs> Not this summer. I'm going to go up He's to the camp. He's playing baseball, yeah. <laughs> baseball. <laughs> I don't know. Maya is surprised to find they live in a mobile home. Oh. Though it is very well kept. Oh. So the mom's doing a bit better, hey? Yeah, yeah. Um, he, I think Bailey seems rich in stamps. <laughs> Does that make sense? <laughs> Sorry, no, I know it stamps the place, but it just sounds like he's rich <laughs> in stamps. He's got so many stamps. <laughs> he's like, how many letters can you send? <laughs> <laughs> They're worth money. They are. <laughs> Every you, stamp's a dollar. <laughs> you look like you would have a stamp collection. I tried it for like half an hour, and then I got half bored. Half an hour? Um, Someone gave me some stamps and I put them in a book and I was like, this is boring. <laughs> no. Yeah, people that collect stamps and coins, I'm like, there are other things you can do. <laughs> you can collect things that do stuff. Oh my god, I'm going to get cancelled by a stamp and or coin collecting Big stamp. society. <laughs> Big stamp. Big coin. Oh. Cancel me. Yes, so Dolores and Maya immediately don't get along. <laughs> yeah. Bailey is a chef for the Naval Hospital. Ooh. Um, <laughs> but they call him like a military medical nutritionist or something. Mean? They like, I don't know, they like fluff it up the, the role. Who's and Make me? it sound more in they, the uh, Dolores and Bailey. Oh. Uh, yeah, they make it sound maybe a little bit more fancy than it is. <laughs> he. So you're a hospital cook. <laughs> it took me so long, I was going to say janitor. <laughs> I was like, that's not it. That's not it. Um, but Bailey speaks fluent Spanish and he pops across the border to Mexico all the time <laughs> oh. ostensibly to fetch ingredients Ingr anyway he invites Maya along for a trip I'm trying to wink at you can you look at me when you said ingredients I was like <laughs> <laughs> so he invites Maya to come with him to Mexico <gasps> fun when they get to the border guard he and the guard share a bottle of whiskey for about half an hour laughing and joking together while Maya waits in the car <laughs> is the guard like a chill white dude. I think he might be Mexican. Oh yeah. I think he might be a chill Mexican. That's that was the impression I got. Although I don't. Does know she mention said. whenever someone is white in the book? Does she Usually, make a point? Yeah. yeah it is. Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Like. I think it. Yeah. I think it's important <laughs> in a way. Yeah. No. Just we should all mention it all the time. Probably. 
And not just assume, like, yeah, because I guess people assume. Yeah, if you, it's so, it's so crazy. Like, every time I hear a character, I just assume they're white. Mm. Isn't that insane? Like, yeah. unless otherwise specified. Because that's the way the rest of culture is, you know? Yeah, like, like band-aids, skin-colored band-aids. Yeah. Like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> that's so low stakes compared to what we're talking no, about right now but that was like the first it's all this band aid has actually released more colors yeah. now of their skin Oh, that's yeah. nice I suppose although I always think that the, the cool pattern band aids are, yeah, like, are the ultimate why leveler. would I get like a boring ass band aid when I can get one that says like kapow yeah and it has like planes on it or something yeah or, like Mickey Mouse on it yeah oh my god when they hit the road again, eventually, um, they come to a little bar where everyone is delighted to see Bailey. Oh. And there's a big old fiesta with warm Coca-Cola and dancing. Oh, warm Coca-Cola. Bailey seems to relax and actually be himself around these people. He, start, he like drops his affectations. You know how he talked fancy? Yeah. That, uh, and, uh. <laughs> yeah. Um, he seems to actually relax. Maya knows a little school Spanish and starts to really enjoy herself. However, Bailey disappears at one point in the night and she starts to panic. She wonders if he sold her to the guard or someone. She sits in the car, frightened and crying, worried she'll have to sleep there in the car. But eventually Bailey reappears, dead drunk, propped up by two, two of his Mexican friends who help Maya lay him down in the back. Now Maya, 15 and in a foreign country, Is she gonna drive? tries to drive home and it's a manual. <laughs> <gasps> no. <laughs> yeah. So, in a Herculean effort, she manages to lurch all the way to the checkpoint with her dad snoring in the back. I can't believe she didn't. Yeah. In a manual, <clears throat> that would have sounded terrible. Just like, eh. <laughs> oh my God. And like, you know, kangaroo jumping. That's what my mom called it. I don't know if that's a common thing, but like when you stole the engine and you go like lurch. Yes. Like, <laughs> that's. I reckon that's probably what happened. But yeah. Good old. Oh yeah. Um, but when she is at the checkpoint and she tries to leave the checkpoint, she accidentally hits another car. No. So angry Mexicans get out of the car and they start yelling at her and the police are called. No. When Bailey finally wakes up <laughs> and sorts it out with more whiskey and charm. He's just like, eh? <laughs> he was probably up the whole like, time. Oh, we bueno? <laughs> <laughs> Um, <laughs> she, Maya, yeah. is unsatisfied with his lack of admiration for yeah. her achievement. He's not impressed enough. Um, excuse me, she fucking drove. He doesn't yeah. acknowledge it. <laughs> um, and they ride the rest of the way home in silence. I'm guessing he's driving now. Yes. <laughs> not that he should be if he was that drunk. That's true. Back at the mobile home, I think maybe the next day sometime afterwards she hears an argument between Bailey and Dolores mm -hmm. who is claiming that Maya is deliberately coming between them what? he brushes her off and leaves and Maya feels she's feeling virtuous so she comes out to tell Dolores that she had no intention of coming in between them <laughs> Dolores unfortunately calls Vivian a whore unfortunately <laughs> she's just like thanks unfortunately your mom's a whore <laughs> and Maya informs her cordially that she is about to be slapped <laughs> she's like I'm going to slap you, Dolores. Oh my god, like Vivian, like, I'm about to shoot you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, That's Dolores. a great way to get away with something. You, you no, you're like, I warned you. <laughs> there was intent. Like, I told you. Like, it's mm. not a surprise. <laughs> the, you know, no um, no low blows, no cheap shots. Yeah. Um, so she uh, slapped her. Yeah. So, well, she says she's about to slap her, but Dolores jumps up and attacks Maya, who doesn't immediately realize it, but Dolores stabs her with scissors. Where? I think in the back. Because I think the way she described it, Dolores like wrapped her arms around her or something. Um, and she didn't realize that there was something in her hands. But I think, she, yeah, I think that's how it happened. She stopped it with scissors. Maya sulks in the car <laughs> until Bailey gets home. Um, she got stabbed. Is yeah. no one going to look up stab? What kind of scissors though? Like if it's like <laughs> Little sewing. nail scissors, <laughs> no, that's think... nothing. But if it's like sewing scissors... <laughs> I'm not sure, but there is like a pool of blood she's sitting in. Yeah. I'm, when gonna say, Bailey... I'm just gonna say like normal scissors. <laughs> <laughs> like paper scissors. Like paper scissors. <laughs> Woolies scissors. Woolies. No, let's tell them Woolies. Woolies. Anyway, she's stabbed. Yeah, is it still in so, her back? No, 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 no. She's just bleeding. She just has a wound. Um, he drives her to the house of another friend, uh, like another mobile home. 
near by, um, where she's patched up and she spends the night there. Yeah. The next morning, she calmly makes herself some tuna sandwiches and runs away. Yep. Um, she can't return to Vivian. Um, I Why? think something about her seeing the wound and that making trouble between Bailey and Vivian. Oh. Uh. Um, instead, Maya finds a junkyard with a nice grey car where she decides to sleep for the night. <laughs> she wakes up in the morning to a gang of kids surrounding her, black and white and Mexican. They they laugh at her, but eventually they welcome her to their junkyard gang. <laughs> She can stay as long as she likes. (laughs) The only rules are that boys and girls can't sleep in the same car. (laughs) And stealing isn't allowed because it attracts the police. These are like little Dickensian orphans. And everyone pulls whatever money they make. (laughs) So, yeah. Was she the oldest amongst them? No, no, I think she's, you know, in the middle. Teens. What? Maya stays with the gang for a month. (laughs) Wow, has no one known she's run away? <laughs> I think they did. They must have, right? Maybe Bailey just didn't tell anyone. Yeah, he was just like, <laughs> he's like oh. she'll come back, right? <laughs> Vivian's like, how's Maya? And he's like, yes. <laughs> <laughs> How are you? <laughs> <laughs> Can you put her on the phone? <laughs> See ya. <laughs> she's in the shower. <laughs> Again? Yeah. She Still. loves the shower. She's <laughs> getting pruny. <laughs> A month in the show. Yeah. So during this time, she enters and wins second place at a dance competition with one of the Mexican junkyard boys. <laughs> she also says so she learns to appreciate appreciate diversity and tolerance that month. Oh. A lesson that she carries with her for the rest of her life. I think it's like the most diverse group of people she's ever been yeah. a part of in her life. Up to God, that point. Maya Angelou has gone through so much. When Apparently, even... this is the first of like six autobiographies. This is just this one just goes till she's sixteen. Are you serious? <laughs> yes. Oh my God, she's movie. done a lot, a lot, a lot. But anyway, continuing on oh with God, the junkyard. <laughs> she's just like, <laughs> <laughs> whoa. <laughs> At the end of the summer, she calls Vivian and asks her to pay her hair for home. <laughs> So she's like, summer's over. (laughs) Bye, guys. (laughs) The wound is mostly healed. (laughs) The group wishes her well and isn't too cut up about her leaving. When she gets home, Bailey seems to have grown up a lot and isn't super interested in her stories, but they still enjoy going to the dance halls together. However, Vivian and Bailey are becoming estranged. At one night, an argument prompts him to leave home, staying in a boarding house with his white prostitute girlfriend, who Vivian disapproves of. I don't know why. Wait, no, wait, I can't possibly understand why. <laughs> Were you just going to breeze past white prostitute girlfriend? <laughs> so uh, there's something, it's something about like, he's trying to model himself on the kind of gangster element that Vivian's friends are, that they hang out with and they have, that's the kind of thing they would do, I guess. I guess, but she doesn't. She doesn't approve of it. I guess if Maya's fifteen, he'd be like seventeen. Yeah, he should, I think sixteen. Yeah, yeah, he'd be wanting to. Still young, but yeah. Well, he lost his V plates at like what? Thirteen or something. Yeah, Jesus. So really young. Yeah. Oof, boof, boof. They reconcile pretty quick, but he gets a job in the South Pacific, so he's working on ships in some capacity. Are you jealous? Yes. <laughs> yes. No. Maya's pretty bummed about Bailey leaving, but he re- reassures her that it's his time to leave the nest. Yes. At 16. That's normal, Bethel. Maya asks her mum if she can take a semester off school to just have a job for a while. And her mum is a chill boss and says, that's fine. <laughs> Get that breath. Maya decides, come hella high water, she's going to be a tram conductor. <laughs> Get a tram, San Fran. <laughs> They oh do have trams. <laughs> well, they did at least. Because <laughs> she likes their uniforms and their cool change bags. Oh my god. It takes a lot of petitioning and being knocked back. But through her stubbornness, she's able to secure a position as San Francisco's first black female tram conductor at the oh age my... of 15. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Sam just hid under her blanket. This woman. <laughs> Sometime, oh dear, sometime during this period, Maya reads The Well of Loneliness by Radcliffe Hall, which is her first introduction to the idea of lesbianism. But she doesn't really understand what a lesbian is and confuses it with hermaphrodite, then called, I think now called intersex. Mm. She worries that her deep voice, big feet, underdeveloped breasts and hips and lack of underarm hair mark her out to be a lesbian. Oh, no. And she eventually confesses to Vivian that she's worried about a strange growth on her vagina. 
which turns out to just be her labia. <laughs> <laughs> which Vivian patiently helps her figure out, telling her to, you know, get down Webster's Dictionary and they kind of read through everything and <laughs> Vivian tells her everything's normal and she's going to be okay. But Maya decides to have sex with a boy to settle the matter once and for all. Most of her male acquaintances chase light-skinned girls with, like, big breasts and wine hips and, and all. Yeah, you know, hot girls. <laughs> Maya decides surprise is going to be her weapon of choice. So she approaches one of the handsome boys who she knows who lives nearby and asks him point blank if he wants to have sex. He's stoked, and they do. (laughs) But she's disappointed at how dull and unromantic it is. Three weeks later, she realizes she's fallen pregnant. What? (laughs) Yep. (laughs) Is there, has there been like a... Like a movie made from any of the... I'm not sure. So much is happening. Maybe. Maya manages to keep her pregnancy a secret from her family for eight months. Apart from Bailey, who she writes to and she like, tells him. Wait, how, what? Is she, is she Amy Santiago in season three? Just with like <laughs> big bags in front of her stomach or like Maybe. a computer monitor. She's like, oh, I'm just carrying this. Everyone's like, what is that? This like, is, it's the 40s. <laughs> she's always just got like baskets in front of her, like doing the laundry. <laughs> Uh, so she knows Vivian opposes abortions and she also fears that Vivian would make her quit school if she found out she was pregnant. So she finishes school while keeping her baby, uh, her pregnancy a secret. And after graduation, she's like, okay, (laughs) now I can tell you (laughs) now that I've graduated. Graduated like high school? Yes. Okay. Um, That sucks. She has like boring sex once and then she gets pregnant. I know. It's a bummer, right? That sucks. Happens. Maya. Vivian and Daddy Clydell are supportive and warm about it. All right. Though they are surprised that she managed to hide it. Yeah. Somehow. How? Does she uh, list any... Sorry. Does she list any examples? Are there any, like, hijinks? No. Like, some no, she of Doubtfarian... Doubtfarian... I just... I couldn't tell you. I'm out. Maya gives birth to a son. Um, she names him Clyde, I believe, but then he changed his name later. So I think his name's George now, but we might need to... Tri- Why would he change his name? Um, I'm not sure. Some Daddy Clyde. The oh, yeah. Had. She might have named him after. Is that not what you were getting at? Well, Clyde L spelt with an I. And Clyde spelt with a Y. So I didn't, I didn't, it didn't click for me. Can you? Hold on, can you check that really quick? It's Clyde have you checked with anything? Y. Clyde with a Y. He yeah. might have changed his name to Guy Johnson. Guy Johnson. She adores the baby, but is afraid to touch him. Mm. Vivian tells Maya she should sleep next to her baby, but Maya is terrified of crushing him in the night. She yeah. tries to stay awake all night, but drifts off, and is eventually woken by Vivian, who tells her to look. And she sees the baby sleeping peacefully in the crook of her arm. Oh! Vivian says... Speaking of babies, <laughs> look who's here. Twink. The oldest baby in the world. <laughs> Vivian says, see, you don't have to think about doing the right thing. If you're for the right thing, then you do it without thinking. Wow. Maya pats her baby gently and falls asleep. And that is the end of the story. Does she ever mention a cage bird? Well, I can tell you about the title because it's taken from a poem by, um, similarly to Of Mice and Men, it's taken from a poem. Um, I can read you the the passage that it comes from because it's like a stanza like george so it's oh that's my so she wrote a poem called <laughs> thank you alana fuck you sandy <laughs> um so the title's taken from a poem by paul lawrence dunbar an afro-american poet and the poem says i know why the caged bird sings army ah, when his wing is bruised and his bosom sore when he beats his bars and would be free it is not a carol of joy or glee, but a prayer that he sends from his heart's deep core, mm. but a plea that upward to heaven he flings. I know where the cage bird sings. Okay, that makes, in that context, it makes sense. Yeah. Okay. I thought I could also, as a treat. What are you going to do now? Read one of my Angelou's sh- shorter poems. Yes. Because she is famous for her poetry. And this one's a really beautiful one that I think kind of... Like, what a bad bitch. I love her. Yeah. This one's beautiful. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So, she lived from 1928 to 2014. Oh, re- oh yeah. I remember. People, mm-hmm. yeah, it was just like. It was a big deal. 1928. So, this is her poem called Still I Rise. And you'll probably recognize it. 
You may write me down in history with your bitter, twisted lies. You may trod me in the very dirt, but still, like dust, I'll rise. Does my sassiness upset you? Why are you beset with gloom? Because I walk like I've got oil wells pumping in my living room. Just like moons and like suns with the certainty of the tides, just like hopes springing high, still I'll rise. Do you want to see me broken, bowed head and lowered eyes, shoulders falling down like teardrops, weakened by my soulful cries? Does my haughtiness offend you? Don't you take it awful hard because I laugh like I've got gold mines digging in my own backyard. You may shoot me with your words, you may cut me with your eyes, you may kill me with your hatefulness, but still, like air, I'll rise. Does my sexiness upset you? Does it come as a surprise that I, that I dance like I've got diamonds at the meeting of my thighs? Mm. Out of the huts of history's shame, I rise. Up from a past that's rooted in pain, I rise. I'm a black ocean, leaping and wide, welling and swelling, I bear in the tide. Leaving behind nights of terror and fear, I rise. Into a daybreak that's wondrously clear, I rise. Bringing the gifts that my ancestors gave, I am the dream and the hope of the slave. I rise, I rise, I rise. Yes. Ugh. And that is Maya Angelou. I know why the cage bird sings. So do I. <laughs> <laughs>